To those of you living in the UK, good evening. To those in Australia, good morning. And to those working for the European Union, goodbye. I'm speaking to you as a member of the Campaign for an Independent Britain, first formed in 1969. We are cross-party, non-racist and non-sectarian, supported by public donations. What do we stand for? Well, I suppose the opposite of what most British politicians stand for. We want the United Kingdom to withdraw from the European Union. We seek the repeal of the European Communities Act 1972, under which EU law takes precedence over UK laws. Once self-government has been recovered, our country would be free as an independent nation state to cooperate and trade with our neighbours in Europe and with countries elsewhere in the world without the restrictions imposed by EU membership. This does not make us anti-European, which is just a silly jibe from our opponents. On the contrary, we support friendly nations with our European neighbours. How did we get into this mess in the first place, you might ask? In the early 1970s, Ted Heath, our one-time Conservative Prime Minister, wanted us all to join a common market. He said he would do this only with the wholehearted consent of the British public. I suppose he was so busy, he forgot to ask us. And although the Labour Party fought tooth and nail to keep us out, in we went. He also made a promise that there would be no essential loss of sovereignty. Sovereignty is like a car. Take the steering wheel out and you lose all control of where you are going. Now, we would like to think that all our politicians look after us, respect our British constitution and honour their oath of allegiance to the Crown. That is why we pay them so much and pay for our second homes in London, long holidays and very nice pensions. Some MPs do an excellent job. Others prefer to do what they are told to do as not to harm their careers, like voting to pass the EU Constitution Lisbon Treaty, even if they hadn't read it. But what did go on inside our Parliament in 1971 and 1972? And what has happened to our Parliament ever since? Quoting from the recorded facts and from the personal experiences of men who were in Parliament at that time, we want to tell you how we were all led up the garden path. Listen to what ex-MPs have to say about how they and the rest of us were never told the whole truth, as most of the Labour Party sought unsuccessfully to keep us out of the common market. It was a battle won by the Conservative and Liberal parties by a very narrow margin. The Labour Party in the general election of 1983 promised to take us out of the European community if elected, so that, for example, we could all buy cheaper food. The Labour Party lost that election, but two men won their Labour seats in Parliament for the very first time, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, who promptly forgot their manifesto promise. Tony Blair had promised in his election address at Sedgefield, we'll negotiate a withdrawal from the EEC, which has drained our natural resources and destroyed jobs. One day, with the help of MPs loyal to the Crown and not to the EU, the 1972 European Communities Act will be repealed to enable us to govern our own country once again with a parliament that is more than a bus stop to and from Brussels if we have politicians we can trust. There is a better future for us all in the wide world outside restrictive EU membership. Conservative, Labour and Lib Dem parties try to hoodwink us by saying that our country cannot cope on our own in this modern world. Don't try telling that to your grandfather and grandmother. Hello, I'm Lord Stoddart of Swindon, the joint, cha joint president of the campaign for an independent Britain. And I'm here to talk about Britain's membership of the common market uh, and what has now become the European Union. And we must go back to the Macmillan government um, 
to understand the reasons for Britain's enmeshment uh, in the European adventure. Harold Macmillan um, uh, believed that Britain had become ungovernable and, in Macmillan's own words, needed to feel the chill wind of competition. Thus began the drive to join what was then usually referred to as the common market. Edward Heath uh, was put in charge of negotiations. There were stumbling rocks on the way. Charles de Gaulle, the then French president, um, blocked Britain's uh, application. And there was uh, an intervention when a Labour government opposed to Britain joining um, a policy which they had uh, had since Hugh Gateskill made his great speech at the 1962 Labour Party conference when he said that Britain's participation in a federal Europe would mean the end of Britain as an independent state. It means the end, he said, of a thousand years of history. That speech is as relevant today as it was then. Unfortunately, the Labour government resumed the talks with the EEC with the Europhiliac George Brown in charge of them. But Labour lost office and the Tories were back in power. Now, Heath's promise at the 1970 uh, election asked simply for a mandate to ne negotiate no more and no less. But in fact, he broke that promise. He broke that manifesto commitment and he went on to negotiate a very bad deal for Britain and the Commonwealth and sacrifice Britain's fishing industry and fishermen by making fish an EEC resource. Then, breaking his election promise, uh, put a bill before Parliament, which gained a second reading by only eight votes, and that majority was only obtained by making the vote one of confidence, meaning that Parliament would be dissolved if the bill failed to get a second reading. That was truly a momentous occasion. Um, voting transcended party loyalties in many cases. Uh, even more, um, vote, the vote was only obtained by the government giving false assurances about the likely adverse effects on the Commonwealth. There was a cross-party committee of which I was a member which coordinated the opposition to the bill. Um, it met in Room H uh, in the House of Commons and all sorts of famous people including uh, Teddy Taylor and Enoch Powell and Peter Shaw attended those meetings um, and uh, uh, we coordinated the arguments and what was to happen during the debates at the committee and report stage of the bill. For myself, I had been opposed to joining the common market as it then was called um, since 1962. Indeed, my first speech against it was at Woolhampton uh, in 1962 in the Newbury constituency, uh, which I was then contesting as the Labour candidate. Uh, and I referred to it when I spoke against the European Commun Communities Bill in the House of Commons on the 21st of, uh, 21st of October 1971. I ended that speech in these words. Perhaps the pro-Europeans do not believe that this country still has a great role to play as an independent institution. In spite of some parts in our history, I believe that an independent Britain has been a good force in the world. I do not want to see that force submerged in a sea of Europeanism. I believe in Britain. I believe in the capacity of the British people to sustain themselves and assist, of the rest, and assist the rest of the world. And that is why I shall vote against entry. And I have to say that I've seen no reason since then to change my mind. I haven't changed my mind since 1971. Indeed, my opposition uh, to the European project has grown as the engine of ever closer union 
grinds on inexorably towards full union, in other words, a country called Europe, in which nations become provincial ciphers in a powerful, centralized, undemocratic state. Now, people sometimes say to me, why do you oppose the European Union? The people voted in a referendum to go in. That actually is not true. The British people were never asked by Heath whether they wanted to go in or not. Um, they weren't given that opportunity. But what happened was that the Labour government, which followed in 1974, agreed that they would have a referendum. And that referendum was about staying in common market, as it then was, uh, and not about joining. And that, of course, is an entirely different question. We were already in the EEC, and people don't like leaving an organization without it having had a chance to prove itself. But the 1975 referendum, um, agreed by the Labour government, uh, after, a sham, after a sham negotiation, I might add, uh, which altered nothing of substance, was heavily weighted against the Come Out campaign. The government itself, um, against uh, party, Labour Party policy, recommended a yes vote. Virtually all the media was in favour of a yes vote. The BBC conspired with the Europhiles to help sway people to vote yes, and business also swung in favour of staying in. In money terms, the stay-in campaign had at least 20 times the amount of money to spend than the come-out campaign, and there were two pamphlets, one from the government uh, recommending a yes vote um, from the stay-in side, but only one from the get-out side. So again, uh, those people who wanted to come out um, had the bad end of the stick. But in spite of all that, in spite of all the money which was used to try to keep us in, still a third of the electorate voted to come out. And that's something which should always be remembered. In my own constituency of Swindon, there was a great interest among voters. Meetings were packed, and a lot of open-air meetings and door-to-door -door canvassing raised interest. But industry, commerce and the farming industry were actively helping the Yes campaign. Sir Donald Stokes, who was then chairman of the uh, British Leyland Motor Corporation, warned in a letter to all his workers in Swindon uh, that if we left the EEC, the car industry would collapse. The Metal Box Company chairman, replying to an article which I wrote recommending withdrawal uh, from the EEC, said that it was essential to the future of Metal Box that Britain stayed in. Well, we did stay in. And the British car industry has collapsed, uh, only saved by the Japanese, and Metal Box is long gone, as is nearly two-thirds of our manufacturing industry. In 1972, 32% of Britain's gross domestic product was in manufacturing. In 2008, it was 13%. That is the measure of the collapse of manufacturing industry in our country. So much for the chill wind of competition. So much for it. It destroyed great industries entirely, and uh, many more uh, are shadows of their former selves. Every year we are running a balance of payments deficit of 27 billion pounds, and our industry is being clobbered by regulations being churned out by Brussels and tamely accepted uh, by the government, whilst at a time of severe financial economic uh, crisis, British taxpayers continue to pay gross contributions to the EU budget at the rate of £14 billion a year. That money could be well spent on resuscitating British industry, but it won't be. It will be wasted in uh, absurd projects coming from the, from the European Union. Unfortunately, no major political party 
is prepared to end this disaster. The Labour Party, which continued to demand, demand withdrawal um, until Neil Kinnett became leader, is now the most Europhile uh, of the lot. In 1983, the Labour Party manifesto promised withdrawal. But in 1985, Kinnett got the policy changed because, he said, Labour could only win the general election of, in 1987 if it was changed. Well, uh, the election of 1987 was won handsomely not by Kinnock and the Labour Party, but by, by the Conservatives. And indeed, even in 1992, the Conservatives scraped home. Kinnock resigned uh, as Labour leader and went on to become a European Commissioner. That says it all. So now then, uh, in our um, 33rd year of membership, Britain is still mired in the European morass. In these years, it has been extended, um, it has ex extended its powers, ratchet by ratchet, they have gained control uh, or influence over virtually every aspect of our lives. Some 70% of legislation emanates from the European Union and our Parliament at Westminster has no power to alter it. Increasingly power is being exercised by bureaucrats and decisions are often made on the hoof by heads of government meeting uh, over a weekend. But the march towards full union grinds on. The Lisbon Treaty ratified by Britain without the promised referendum and urged on by Tony Blair, uh, is waiting in the wings. It will further enhance the powers of the European Union. It will have a legal personality, a full-time president, and the power to um, amend uh, aspects of treaties without the necessity of ratification by national parliaments. Even now, at this moment, uh, the British government is having its policy of bailing out the card industry because of the uh, economic and financial problems because it has to have the agreement of Brussels. And again, they, they are uh, using the financial crisis to try to get even more power uh, over the finances of the EU, especially, of course, the City of London. In France and the Netherlands, and indeed in Ireland, they all rejected the Lisbon Treaty or the Constitution um, by substantial majorities in a people's referendum. But the governments of France simply threw those aside and the Irish are going to be made to uh, vote again. That's what they call democracy in the European Union and the sooner we get out of that sort of democracy and get back to our own tried and tested democratic institution, institutions, the better it will be for all of us and our country. Right, now this is uh, a copy of the European Communities Act 1972, uh, which virtually handed uh, all the power uh, that Parliament has over to the uh, European Union. It's a very thin document, but in fact, the, uh, what it contains is very, very explosive indeed, uh, and uh, undermines the position of our own Parliament and gives uh, the power of the European Court to overrule our own uh, court uh, and that decisions made in Europe uh, must be agreed by our own Parliament without dissent. This is a picture of uh, Tony Blair in March, just before the 1997 general election. He's claiming here to be a British patriot, that he didn't want a federal Europe, uh, nor indeed did he uh, want a single currency. 
But in office, he took very, very serious steps uh, to ensure that Britain should make, uh, take steps towards a federal Europe and indeed became in favor of, a, uh, of Britain joining the Euro. Fortunately, that hasn't yet happened. Uh, so again, he made promises to get elected and then broke them once he was elected. And to show just exactly um, how he changed and how quickly he changed, here is the front page of the Sun on June the 24th, 1998, uh, which describes uh, Blair as the most dangerous man. You can see the, that's the front page headline because, of course, he showed signs then of wanting to ditch the pound and join the euro. That's a copy of the uh, no vote pamphlet which was put out in 1975. And of course, that's the government pamphlet. That's one of the, one of them. And that's the pamphlet of the yes vote. This is a news sheet called the Common, Common Market Special. And you'll see from this that there's a picture of Neil Kinnock, who's saying that uh, uh, being members of the common market would in fact uh, be adverse to our industry and to the workers of this country.